Miguel Vargas is running out of time to prove himself with the Dodgers. Brant Clark sees a glide path to the NHL, only he doesn't want to glide to get there. And for all the recruiting at USC, is it UCLA football that has the better pass rush? Good morning, I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and start for the greatest sports city of the world, Los Angeles. This is the faithful Angelino's morning report. And when I say morning, damn do I mean morning. Hey, it is July 8th, 2023. I'm actually in a glorious mood. Every time we add a new subscriber to this channel, I get happy. Whoever it is, thank you for getting in on the ground floor. And if you like being in the know about LA sports, clickety clack the like button, clickety clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell, hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring, let people know we exist. And yes, comment. I will be home tomorrow with the wife and the rack of blessed abundance. So yes, the good times are rolling. Let me know what you think. So before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Dodgers 11, Angels 4. Mookie Betts went nuts yet again. Two home runs. He was three for four overall with two runs scored and four RBI. Meanwhile, today at six o'clock, Angels and Dodgers again. Michael Grove is 0-2 with a 7.02 ERA. Ryan Detmers 2-5 with a 3.72 ERA. Philadelphia is at the Galaxy. It is Galaxy game day at 7.30. The LA Galaxy, for all the problems they had at the beginning of the year, have a six game unbeaten streak. They have not lost since getting rid of team president Chris Klein. And San Jose is at LAFC, also at 7.30. LAFC is struggling. They've lost three consecutive MLS games, but they are welcoming back defenseman Mamadou Fall. Whether he plays or not tonight is anyone's guess. But I gotta tell you, Miguel Vargas is struggling big time. The rookie, he was known for his bat. They knew he could hit. They knew he could hit so much that the Dodgers were confident that they could just all of a sudden change the position he played and it wouldn't be that big a deal because he was such a natural hitter. And now sending him back to the minors to get his swing back, quote, is not off the table or is on the table, unquote. This is according to manager Dave Roberts. Going into Friday, the highly touted rookie slugger had just six hits in his last 65 at-bats. We mentioned Betts' performance a couple of minutes ago, right? That came while Betts was playing second base, which is a position that was handed to Vargas at the beginning of the year. Now, part of the reason Betts is playing second is because of opposing pitching. When the opponents decide to throw a left-hander out there, the Dodgers will bring Betts in from the outfield to play a middle infield position. That way they can add another left-handed bat to the outfield. But let's not fool ourselves. Let's not get it twisted. Vargas is in a deep hole. According to Roberts, talking about Vargas, quote, clearly right now he's pressing. He's never struggled like this, unquote. So where would the Dodgers go from there? right? Well, you can sit there and say, yeah, we'd we've seen Michael Bush come up to the bigs a couple of times, but Michael Bush over in AAA, he might not be the solution because you're substituting one rookie for another rookie. Is Michael Bush actually ready? We don't know. We know that Mookie Betts, the Dodgers would prefer to have him play in the outfield, but out of necessity, try and lengthen the lineup by having him play infield. Chris Taylor is still hurt. He's not near coming back. Now the coaching staff at the Dodgers is telling us all to be patient because it doesn't mean Vargas won't have a good career. The guy's still only 23. But take a moment and consider what the Dodgers have to do. We've talked so much about the injuries to the Dodger pitching staff. Yesterday alone, the top story was how the 10th Dodgers pitcher went on the injured list. How much more rope do you give Miguel Vargas? The Kings have been running their summer development camp. Now this is different from say OTAs in the NFL where everybody comes by and they just walk through plays and lift little weights, you know, snap each other with towels, you know, guy stuff. 
No, this is simply for the rookies and the younger players, the minor league prospects. It runs every year. Um, and it runs through Monday. But all eyes now are on defenseman Brant Clark. Recall, the Kings used to have the prime farm system in the NHL. But a lot of those guys now have either graduated, for lack of a better term, to the NHL, or frankly have been traded to as part of improving the team. So that means Clark is the go-to guy. He is the headliner. He is the reason, for example, that LA was perfectly willing to send a young defenseman named Sean Dursey over to Arizona. He's the number eight overall pick in the 2021 draft. He got a sniff of the NHL last year, about a almost 10 games. He couldn't play more, otherwise there would have been contract salary cap issues. So Clark is saying, quote, you want the easiest path to get into the lineup, but you know it's never easy. I think the front office has a lot of faith in me and I'm really appreciative of that. He said that to The Athletic. He's still 20 pounds lighter though to where he believes he needs to be in order to be a consistent NHL player. Let's be real, it's a very physical league. He's only 185 pounds. Dude needs to mix in a few Tommy burgers but he does in fact have a wide ass open path to the NHL. But then again, so did Miguel Vargas to the major leagues. I think it's uh, plenty obvious to most of us that the current Kings goalies are not inspiring confidence. The reason that the Kings, aside from the fact that they're a much different team than they were a couple of years ago, but the reason that they're getting to the playoffs is the system that they play. Todd McClellan plays a system that keeps the opponent from getting shots away in the first place. You know the old Gretzky cliched quote about missing 100% of the shots that you don't take, right? But once you take them, once you get in a position to have a good shot, you actually have a good chance of getting in a goal. So I would say this, yes, you should be uninspired by the current Kings goalie situation. Cam Talbot is not a number one goalie anymore. So you basically have a career minor leaguer and a career, and what right now in his career is a backup goalie being your two net minders. But can I give you just a little ray of optimism? Not for next year, but maybe for the immediate future. You take that 2.5 million that the two Kings goalies are making. You can get rid of that when they're free agents next year. Andre Kopitar's contract goes from 10 million to seven. That boosts it up to five and a half million. NHL salary cap experts are forecasting that the salary cap will increase by four million for the year after this. You would wind up with somewhere in the neighborhood, if true, of nine and a half million dollars in cap space. Theoretically, you still have the vast majority of your team together. I don't necessarily know who the upcoming free agents would be, but I think you'd probably in a decent shot, decent running to add yourself an elite goalie, maybe pull one up from the minors and run with that. I keep saying this like a mantra. Some people cross their legs, they light scented candles and they chant. Me, ever since January 2nd, I've been saying that the first school to sanity wins. Whether it's USC or UCLA, the first football team that plays with sanity wins. In other words, the team that actually decides to play defense. Because I thought it was only going to be UCLA after they got humiliated by a third string quarterback with Pittsburgh. And then UCLA totally face plants on the national stage in the Cotton Bowl against Tulane. I didn't even remember Tulane fielded a football team. And they just trample the Trojans' defense. So the Trojans, they go out, and they, you know, they, they bring in a bunch of guys to the transfer portal for the next season, and they've got a terrific class for 2024. But, but, does UCLA actually have the better pass rush? Pause for a minute, moment and consider edge rusher Leatu Leitu came in from Washington. He's been selected as a preseason All-American. Now granted, it's a fourth 
team preseason All-American, but if you have two edge rushers per team, doesn't that argue that maybe Leitu is one of the top eight edge rushers in the country? Doesn't it? And can you see why? Consider, he recorded 10 and a half sacks last year with Washington, along with 23 solo tackles and three forced fumbles. For all the talk that I gave about Tuli Tuipolotu over at USC last year, and I love talking about him, he led the nation in sacks with 13 and a half. 13 and a half. But do we really want to sit there and claim that Leitu was that far behind at 10 and a half? Do we? I mean, for Pete Six, the guy in addition to, like, Tuli Pelotu, if you think about it, last year, 13 and a half sacks, 31 solo tackles. Lay two, 10 and a half sacks, 23 solo tackles, three forced fumbles. Is it that big of a stretch to say that Lay two could be Tuli Tui Pelotu this year? Could he lead the nation in sacks with just a little bit of extra gumption from an extra year in college football? I can see it. Mike Martz was considered brilliant as an offensive coordinator. Terrible as a head coach, but a brilliant offensive coordinator. Sure, I mean, sure, he got the St. Louis Rams to a Super Bowl, but nobody was going to put him in the same pantheon as a Belichick or a Lombardi or a Tom Landry, for Pete's sakes. Anyway, they asked him what he thought of the Rams coaching staff. And Martz is just considering offensive coordinator Mike LaFleur a home run hire, unquote. Said uh, Martz, quote, LaFleur will be another set of eyes for Sean McVay, and that's healthy for him. It will help neutralize him, or I should say it will help revitalize him because there is a lot of pressure when you're the main guy putting it all in there week in and week out, unquote. Now, why we've heard things like this before from analysts, but why does it matter for Martz? Could it be that Martz was a terrific offensive coordinator, but he wound up being the guy putting everything in week in and week out? It got him away from his specialty, designing plays, X's and O'ing, and as a result, the St. Louis Rams and the Chicago Bears eventually suffered because he couldn't be the big picture guy. Sean McVay is trying to be both the big picture guy and the X and O guy. So yeah, if Mike Martz thinks that he could have used a quality pair of extra eyes back when he was coaching, and he sees Sean McVay getting it now, is it possible then that there will be a course correction with the Rams offense next year? Now, I'm not going to try and tell you that the USC basketball program has this great history. Come on. Who are the neighbors up in Westwood? Compare histories. You tell me. But they have had a, a number of players who have had a little bit of a surprising impact. You know, guys that all of a sudden become all-stars and you're like, wait, that guy went to USC? DeMar DeRozan is one of them. You almost have to be reminded that DeMar DeRozan played for USC, right? I have to pause and remember that. DeRozan had his number retired, as a matter of fact, until now. DeRozan is letting DJ Rodman, Dennis Rodman's son, wear his retired number 10 next year. And the Trojans, we've already talked about that repeatedly, how their recruiting class for next year is just top notch. Their poised to probably make a run this year. Frankly, probably be better than UCLA. We'll have to wait and see. But the, but the alumni, the graduates with street cred over at USC believe in this team too. Would you let me know what you think of the comments thread? Talk to me about Miguel Vargas and how much rope you would give him. Is Brant Clark a sure thing, not just to make the opening night roster, but to be a quality NHL defender, even though he is super duper young? And if you enjoyed this content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back later tonight with a rapid recap of Galaxy Soccer. Faithful Angelinos is a key and Corte El Queso production. Take care.